we're doing this sermon series in conjunction with roughly, th- I think it's 284 churches throughout the Bay Area. Um, and we're asking these questions. So we ask, week one, does life have a purpose? Yes. Um, does God exist? You are rational for believing so. Uh, why does God permit pain and suffering? Because he's got a plan to deal with it, and it's proceeding nicely. Thank you very much. Is Christianity too narrow last week? Not too narrow politically, but appropriately narrow morally and spiritually. And tonight, we ask, is Jesus really God? Now, this is the one that sets Christianity apart. I actually, I tremble as I think about this question because in my mind, this is the most important question that you can ask. I see three subsidiary questions that arise here. First, does the Bible actually claim that Jesus is God? Second, if so, is there any reason to believe it? And third, how can I find out for myself? So first, does the Bible actually teach that Jesus is God? Is that a claim? Because if not, why are we even having this conversation? Um, I was once having lunch with the third previous, I think, dean for religious life at Stanford. And he mentioned in an offhanded way that he was convinced Jesus had never claimed to be God. uh, And the Bible didn't teach that Jesus was God. That's like later Christian accretion. Uh, Something that cults that I run into sometimes deny as well. The Bible doesn't teach that Jesus is God. Um, So does the Bible claim it? Uh, Yes, absolutely. Several times. It's not hard to find. I question the reading comprehension of those who believe it does not. Um, I'm going to give you my favorite reference. There's a lot, but here's one that is just so beautiful to me. Acts 20, verse 28. Paul is preaching a sermon or giving it an admonition to the elders at Ephesus. He says, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Whose blood bought the church? Jesus. Whose blood is it called in this passage? God. God's blood bought the church. Jesus is God. It's, the reason I like this one is it's an implicit claim. It's not like you could really debate, like, you know, the fine points of grammar and the possessive pronoun. And it's like, oh, no, no, no. It's the blood of God that bought the church. And it was the blood that was shed on the cross that came from the, the man, Jesus, the Christ. There's lots of other references, but I don't think I need to belabor this point because for few of you here, is it really a question, does the Bible make the claim? The much bigger question is, is there any reason in the year 2023 that we should believe this, quite frankly, extravagant claim? And I really debated how to approach this. Because there's all sorts of ways that I could structure my arguments, that I could introduce evidence. Um, But at the end of the day, I think they all fail, not because they're bad arguments, but because the, the nature of the question is one. Well, let me phrase it this way. Let's say that I made the claim that I'm the son of Elvis. It's plausible. I was born a few years before he died. Like, he could, like, chronologically be my dad, right? But if I told you I'm Elvis' son, you'd be like, huh? You don't look like him. Uh, and, like, you know, stuff that, like, well, I had a really short mom or whatever, right? Uh, and, and you'd be like, what, she's like, what evidence could I give you that you would possibly believe? I could tell you stories, and you'd be like, bro, stories are easy. I I could give you, like, you know, a family tree. You're like, bro, you could make that in Microsoft Word. Um, I could say, well, here's my my DNA test, and you're like, well, I don't know what Elvis' DNA is. They didn't do a genetic test on him. Like, it's a much smaller claim. But every bit of evidence I could give you is not just open to doubt, but practically invites massive doubt. And if I can't give you irrefutable evidence for a claim like that, how could I possibly give you evidence that is beyond questioning, that surpasses all deniability that Jesus is the son of the living God? So I'm going to go a different route altogether. And I want you to just think about human nature, because this is something that we all have keen insight into being humans ourselves. There are three people who became convinced that Jesus was God, whose whose experiences are worth reflecting on. Jesus' best friend, Jesus' brother, and one of Jesus' enemies. And after we've looked at them, I'm going to invite you to consider how you can investigate this question fruitfully. So first, Jesus' best friend believed he was God. 
And here I'm speaking about John the Apostle. He's plausibly Jesus' best friend. A, a candidate might also be Lazarus, but at the least, he's one of Jesus' very best friends. Now, all you have friends. What would it take for you to become convinced that your best friend at Stanford was actually God? Right? Let's lower it. Just that your best friend is morally perfect, flawless, because that's the conclusion that John signed on to. Hey, my friend, he never sinned. Every time we disagreed about something, he was morally in the right. Bro, if anyone knows your junk, it's your friends. Like, if anyone you don't want to be quoted in the New York Times when you run for Senate someday, it's your best friend. Like, that, they got the dirt. They know where the skeletons are buried. They help you bury them, man. That is, like, bad news. If you try to tell your friend, yo, dog, I've been mention this for a while, but I'm actually God, you'll be met with either puzzled silence or outright laughter. We all know it, right? And yet John wrote this in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Skipping down to verse 14. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Write that about your bestie. No way. No chance. Now, John didn't believe this from the beginning. He first approached Jesus just as a religious leader. He's like, this guy's got some teaching. This guy's got some, some soundness. I like what he has to say. And over time, he began convinced that Jesus was not just a teacher, but Messiah. And then not just Messiah, but God. The word made flesh. Now, John was either delusional or he encountered reasons that were sufficient to change his mind. And history regards John pretty favorably. He doesn't come across as delusional in the writings that we have. Something to think about. Now, second, it's, it's impressive that Jesus' best friend believed. His brothers believed. Now, I'm technically speaking of Jesus' half-brother. Um, uh, the son is of Joseph uh, and Mary. But Galatians 1, 18 to 19, Paul says, Then, three years later, I went to Jerusalem to get to know Peter. And I stayed with him for 15 days. The only other apostle I met at that time was James, the Lord's brother. 1 Corinthians 9, 5. Paul writing uh, to the church at Corinth. Don't we have the right to bring a believing wife with us as the other apostles and the Lord's brothers do? And as Peter does. The brothers of Jesus became leaders in the early church. One of them, as I said, was James. What does James call his brother in his book? James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you have a sibling, raise your hand. What would it take for you to call your sibling the Lord? <laughs> Whatever that threshold of proof is for you, it was met in James's life. He was at least that convinced. Well, Glenn, maybe, 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 he didn't really believe, but he was like trying to get in on this, like this gig that Jesus had. You know, Jesus is dead now. I'm going to slide in there and I'm going to get all of his all of his cred, you know, and get all of his glory. What was there to get? Like, Christianity was not then what it is now. It was not the world's largest religion. It was the world's, like, spit-on group. Like, the founder notoriously died. <laughs> and then the early Christians were persecuted. There was nothing for them to lead that was good. They were just pinning a target on their backs for the Roman Empire that crucified people on the regular. They were so convinced. Jesus' brothers were so convinced their brother they had grown up with was God in the flesh that they changed their mind and were willing to risk martyrdom. Earlier in the Gospels, they would try to stop Jesus. Like, what, you're out of your mind. What are you saying? No, stop. Come back home. And, and Jesus wouldn't do it. They thought he was nuts. Something happened to change their mind. And we see what it is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 to 8. Paul, a guy we've mentioned already, we'll mention again in a moment, makes this observation. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, that's another name for Peter, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, Last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. What changed James's mind? That his brother was God? 
we saw his brother die, and then he saw his brother walking around again. And then when his brother said, I know something about eternity, he's like, you have my undivided attention. You know something about this life that I don't know. And all these previous data points, that were, I just thought you were the goody two-shoes in the family. I didn't realize you were actually really good. I just thought you, like, maybe, like, did some, some things that were impressive and people call them miracles, but, like, you actually are doing insane stuff in front of my eyes right now. And he went on to become an elder in the church. Now, if that didn't happen, it's hard to account for James's change of heart. Then finally, one of Jesus' enemies believed. This is not an uncommon story throughout history, actually. You can find lots of stories of people who began as skeptics of Christianity and got irritated by it, decided to debunk it, and became converted along the way. It happened at Stanford a couple years ago. Um, uh, Abigail, where are you at? You talked to Alicia today. Um, uh, Alicia is married to Sterling. Sterling was an atheist who came to Christ in our ministry because he came to Chi Alpha in order to debunk, debunk Christianity. And he dug into it and was like, Dag nabbit, they're right. Um, that happens. Um, but there's one guy in particular I'd like us to focus on tonight. His name is Paul. Now, Paul hated Christians. Didn't just disagree with them. He hated Christians and thought the Christian claims were nonsense. And we know exactly what changed Paul's mind. We saw it alluded to in 1 Corinthians a few minutes ago. Christ appeared to me as one abnormally born. He tells the story in more detail in Acts chapter 22. Starting in verse 2, he says, Then Paul said, I'm a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. I studied under, under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the laws of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of the way, an early name for Christianity, to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. As the high priest and all the council can themselves testify, I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus, and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. About noon, as I came near to Damascus, suddenly a bright light flashed from heaven around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, uh, he's also called Paul. Uh, like many Asian students, he has a different name for different cultures. Why do you persecute me? No, that's it. You, people think God changed Saul's name to Paul. Like, fake news, doesn't happen. He goes by Saul in certain contexts, the Jewish context. He goes by Paul in Gentile context. Why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord, I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. And he changed teams. He became a Christian. He actually went on to write a huge chunk of the New Testament. And he talks about the deity of Jesus in a few places. I love Titus 2.13. We wait, Paul says, for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus' best friend became convinced he was God. Jesus' brothers became convinced he was God. Jesus' enemy became convinced he was God. Does that prove he was God? No. But it makes me think. It makes me wonder what could have happened some 2,000 years ago to launch a movement from previous skeptics that has gone on to transform the world, to found hospitals, to actually in innovate science, to uh, create whole new systems of being in the world. The only answer I can come up with is that Jesus is who he said he was and did what the Bible claims he did. There's this fascinating interchange in Matthew chapter 16. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked? Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you're the Messiah, son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Just like today, there's a lot of opinions about Jesus. Walk around this campus, ask people who Jesus is. Your skeptical friends will say one thing, your Muslim friends will say something else, your Jewish friends will have a different opinion, your Buddhist friends, your Christian, everyone's going to have a different perspective on who Jesus is. Some say, some say, some say. Jesus' answer is always the same. But who do you say that I am?
Peter says, you're not just some guy. You're the son of God. And Jesus says, you're not just that smart, Peter. You didn't just figure this out. God did a work in your heart to open your eyes. And if you don't yet believe that Jesus is God, this is what needs to happen for you. I can give you all the reasons in the world, and I think there are plenty of good reasons, more than I've gone to tonight. But at the end of the day, unless God opens your eyes to the truth, the beauty, and the power of the gospel, it won't ever deeply take within you. And so if you're not a follower of Jesus, my request of you tonight is simply this. Ask God to show you who he is. Pray a prayer like this. God, if you're there, I'd like you to reveal yourself to me in a way that is meaningful and persuasive to me. And then just see what happens. Be open to God doing a surprising work in your heart and in your life. God, if you're there, show yourself to me. Help me to see Jesus clearly as he is. Let's skip the next passage um, and go down to the second thing I want to encourage you to do is to, um, if you will, download the trial version of Jesus. Um, get the ad-supported version of the app. Um, John 7, 16. Jesus invites you to try him out. Jesus answered, my teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Do you want to know if what Jesus says is from God? Try it. It's easy to spout philosophy. It's easy to just rattle off ideas. Chat GPT will do it for you for free. Give you all kinds of ideas. Jesus says, put it into practice. Go from philosophy to physics. Go from lecture to lab. You try it, and you will quickly discover whether what I teach comes from God or not. And if you read the Gospels and just do what you see there for a week, you will quickly discover there's some power in the teachings of Jesus that is very difficult to account for in the natural. And as you do that, and as you pray that prayer, God, if you're real, show yourself to me in a way that makes sense to me. I think you will conclude that Jesus' teaching is from God. And then, if his teaching is from God, then his teaching about himself being God becomes very germane to tonight's topic. I'm going to close with this passage. Worship team, would you come back up and get ready? John chapter 20, verses 27 to 29. After the resurrection, there's a very famous interchange between a guy named Jesus, who we're talking about tonight, and a guy named Thomas. Thomas was a skeptic. Thomas was like, dead people do not get up and walk around. This is nonsense. You're all having some sort of weird episode. And then Jesus appeared to Thomas. Verse 27, then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, which have been pierced by nails. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. It's my prayer for everyone here tonight. Many of you I know made this choice a long time ago. My encouragement to you is stay strong in it. Many opinions about Jesus abound. You have had your eyes opened by God. And you have put his teaching to the test and found in it power and truth. So stay strong. For those of you who have not yet reached that point, like Jesus said to Thomas, I say to you, stop doubting and believe. He is real and he is worthy of your trust. And your allegiance. So I'm going to pray now, and we're going to go into worship. And here's my uh, invitation to you. As we worship, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, just put that before God. Pray the prayer that I suggested. God, show yourself to me in a way that makes sense. See what happens. Also, on your way out, feel free to grab some of the literature we have there. Uh, we have some free Bibles. Just take one and go. Uh, there's some uh, little booklets, pamphlets about Jesus and whatnot. Take that stuff. Whatever would help you on your journey. And then I would be delighted to treat you to lunch or coffee sometime and answer any questions you have. I realize that in a monologue like this that goes on, you have questions that spin through your head that I don't have time to address. I don't even know that they're there sometimes. You have no questions 
just aren't afraid to dive deep into. And I would love to chat with you as long as you are sincerely interested in exploring the topic. Feel free to chat with me anytime. I'm easy to find online. The information and stuff is on our website at tstanford.org. You can just grab me after the meeting and we can schedule something right from there. Let me pray. God, we don't come together just because we like hearing speeches and clapping. We come together because we want to be touched by your spirit. We want to be transformed, to be more into the people that you have called us to be. So God, tonight as we go into worship, I pray for those who already call you Lord, who understand you in your fullness, God, that you would deepen our awareness and our conviction and help us to live more fully in light of that. And then God, for those who are still on the journey to that discovery, God, I pray that you would meet them tonight by your Holy Spirit. Reveal yourself to them in a way that, Lord, it goes straight to the heart of where their hesitation is, where their question is, where their lingering doubt lies. God, you don't need me or anyone else to defend you. Who defends a lion? You just let it out of its cage. So God, tonight, we invite you. Show up and show off in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.